Okay, you want me to read it out loud? Yeah. Okay. An operator is required to obtain verifiable parent consent before any collection, use, or disclosure of personal information from children, including consent to any material change in the collection, use, or disclosure. Change in the collection, use, or disclosure products to which your parent has pro previously. previously consented. The operator must establish and maintain reasonable protocols to protect confidentiality, security, and integrity of um, personal information collected from children. Those are some kids I met through this project, including your son, reading from an American law called COPPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, which is something you introduced me to, Taylor. Yeah, it's actually a law that has real relevance to everything we've talked about on this show. It determines how tech companies can collect data from kids and what they can and can't do with that data. And what's interesting is even though it's an American law, it's ended up shaping how these companies are built and designed, and so it affects users of these products around the world. Right. I had a couple more questions for these kids. When they say child in that paragraph, what age do you think they mean? Under 18. 15? Or 16? How old do you think an adult is? Uh, I think when they get into their, like, 20s. Okay. Okay. Once they get into, I think, college or university, they're basically about 18. What about you, Tristan? What do you think? Yeah, probably around the same age, I'd say. In COPA, the age of majority on the internet is actually 13. Oh, okay. What do you think about that? I mean, it makes sense considering how popular TikTok is. Because most of the content there is like, would appeal to a 13-year-old. Do you feel like you'll be an adult when you're 13? No, no, definitely not. Um, I feel like at the most it should be under 16. If for whatever reason you're not going to go all the way to 18, which you should, at least go to 16. At least. Do you think you'll be adults when you're 13? No. Yeah. <laughs> My brother was like, what, 14? And he's not mature. <laughs> so Mom's like, like 80. She's an adult. Today we're going to talk about how this happened. How did 13 become the age of adulthood online? And what have the consequences been? This question informs everything we've talked about in this series so far. So is there a way to fix it? Not a piecemeal solution from one platform to another, but something that could make the internet a better place for kids and for the rest of us. I'm Taylor Owen, an academic who studies technology. And when I was 13, my Game Boy couldn't even connect to Wi-Fi. I'm Nicole Edwards, a journalist. And when I was 13, I hid CDs with parental advisory stickers under my bed. And this is screen time. There are huge questions playing out right now over the place of technology in our lives. Facebook was scheming to bring even younger users into their field. You're basically giving out your personal ID to games so they can make money for it. There are some people that I would like to block in real life. We could work together. But I will add that there are tensions because in the app market, their job is to sell, sell, sell. There's a lot that like, I just don't understand. This is their platform, this is their life. Where's the limit? Every parent is struggling with these questions. Governments around the world are trying to keep up and the scale and pace of change is only increasing. In this show, we'll talk to parents and kids about how they navigate the digital world and to the researchers and policymakers who can help us understand the consequences. So Taylor, how did we get here? Why are teenagers being treated as adults online? So it all stems back to a debate in the United States in 1998 over whether kids should be treated differently than adults online. Originally, the debate was about whether that age should be set at 16. But e-commerce sites, which remember were sort of the bedrock of the internet at the time, 
pushed back because they thought this would sort of cut them off from this really lucrative market of kids buying things on the internet. Hmm. And interestingly, it was civil liberties associations and groups which agreed with them because they were worried that if we set that age too high for what defined a kid, that all sorts of rules would be imposed on them and would limit both their speech and their access to information about things like birth control and abortion, resources that these groups thought kids should actually have access to, not be excluded from. So there was bipartisan support between Republicans and Democrats for passing this law to protect kids online. But more importantly, there was agreement between the e-commerce sites and the people protecting online rights that this should actually be set really low at 13. Wow. Okay, so that makes sense, but this was a long time ago. I mean, a long time ago. I, I Perhaps I exaggerate. 1998 <laughs> may not be a long time ago to some. It feels like it was a long time ago for me, and it was in the very early days of the internet. We know the internet had only existed for seven years at that point. It was still dial-up, and Google had just been founded. Social media was miles away, so so much of what we've talked about throughout the course of this season didn't exist, yet this law is still applied. That's right, and, and applied for most people who use the internet around the world. So this one law in America really changed what it meant to be a kid versus an adult on the internet for most people in the world. And, and of course, society adapts, and the way we use the internet has adapted, how, as we've talked about in this show. And as a result, we're starting to see some new legislation emerge around the world that, that could change some of these rules. In the UK, for example, just last year, they introduced something called the Age Appropriate Design Code. This lays out a series of rules that companies have to follow if their website is likely to be accessed by anyone under 18, not 13. Hmm, like what? Well, like stricter rules on data collection for kids, age-appropriate language in privacy policies, and that a child must be notified if their parent is monitoring them, which is an interesting <laughs> reversal of some of this. <laughs> and another piece of legislation is working its way through their parliament called the Online Safety Bill, which would make tech companies proactively remove content like threats, revenge porn, or deliberate false information or face serious financial penalties. And this law has specific provisions for kids. And to be clear, this is not just targeting companies based in the UK. Any website that is accessed by a child in the UK will have to follow these new rules. So I really wanted us to talk to the woman behind these laws. It's not an exaggeration to say that she might have single-handedly changed the internet for children around the world. So Taylor, tell the people about our guest today. Well, her name is Bibin Kidron, Baroness Bibin Kidron. She's a former filmmaker. Her resume includes directing the sequel to Bridget Jones's Diary. She's also a member of the House of Lords in the UK, and she started an advocacy group for children's digital rights called Five Rights, which aims to get countries around the world to modernize their laws around online kids' protections, including in Canada, where I've had the chance to collaborate with her. I was really looking forward to meeting Bevan. We opened the conversation with this idea that we've heard and seen throughout the series, which is that kids are adapting to these new spaces and technologies. She agreed, but she didn't see that as a good thing. Why are they adapting to something that is not acting in their own best interests? And I think that that adaptation point is so important because it leads fundamentally to children just saying in despair, you know, I have no other option. This is the only behavior that is available to me. This is the travesty. This is the injustice that we're asking them to adapt to something not in their best interest. So here in the UK, we have sort of gone ahead and to a degree why we've gone ahead was almost like an accident. We've gone ahead because we introduced the age appropriate design code. 
I am the author, if you like, or the creator or the instigator, whichever word you like. It sits actually now as a piece of law with the data regulator and it sits within existing data protection legislation. And that's how it came about. How is the internet different for a kid in the UK now because of this than it would be for someone in Canada or the United States who doesn't have those same protections? We're really talking about things that are actually quite ordinary in our life, in our governance, in, in the way that we conceive things. And I think that one of the reasons that we're a little bit ahead here in the UK is because we've actually had the courage to say, actually, normal rules apply. Instead of, oh my dear, this is all new, this is 21st century, this is something we can't think about. We've actually gone the other way and we've gone, hey, business, consumer product, you gotta be safe for the kids. And in doing that, we've pulled on existing concepts. And one of the concepts that we've sort of drawn down is the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And one of the most important things about the convention is it says any person under the age of 18 is a child, right? And so gone is this wickedness of pretending that every 13-year-old in the planet has adult sensibility, adult brain, adult experience, can make the sort of nuanced decisions that we demand of adult, the independence of an adult, because actually, literally, we know that that is not the case. And in not being the case, you're actually putting kids at a phenomenal risk. So I think it's our attitude. It's our saying, actually, this is really quite basic. It's pulling down some of the levers, which we already provide. And then it is actually having a fierce community of people here who really, really have supported this agenda. And we were all very closely together and we've managed to get some things over the line. So the Age Appropriate Design Code has been around for a, a bit of time now. And I know it's only partially what you've been pushing for and potentially new protections are going to emerge in the online safety bill, hopefully. How has the experience of being a kid, though, changed already based on the Age Appropriate Design Code? Okay. Uh, that's a really great question. I mean, you know, actually there's hundreds of tiny little changes, but if I say some of the eye-catching ones, so YouTube turns off, by default, autoplay. Now, if you think about what that means when we had statistics that 70% of what you saw, you know, was offered to you by autoplay, by the algorithm, it started before you had a moment to think about it and so on. On Instagram and on TikTok, under 16, they've absolutely disabled the ability for a stranger adult to direct message a kid that is unknown to them or the other way around. And one of the interesting ones was uh, TikTok stopped notifications for under 16 year olds at nine and under 18 year olds at 10 p.m. So you don't get this kind of come back, come back, come back through the night, you know, creating the sleepless epidemic, which is one of the things that young people here complain to me a lot, is that they're just tired all the time. So those are just, you know, one or two of a host of things. And I think that what is so important is not to say, okay, that's great, job done, but is to notice that the job can be done, that actually it can be redesigned in relation to the needs of children, in relation to a piece of legislation. And what's interesting, and this sort of kind of echoes back to your first question, which is, in fact, one of the other untruths is that tech sectors always said, well, we can't do something special. You know, there's no point bringing something in in one country. Well, all of those changes have been made globally. So the difference is we can actually enforce them in the UK because we've got legislation, but actually Canadian kids will benefit from them. Can we pause here for a second? Absolutely. So what Beban is saying is that just like with COPPA, this legislation in the UK will affect Canadian kids since it will force companies like Instagram or TikTok or whoever else to change the way they interact with kids, right? Well, it could. 
if these companies decide to apply the rules being enforced in the UK to all of their users around the world, but that's not guaranteed. Right. So from a Canadian perspective, what exactly would Canada achieve then by introducing new laws? Well, they would have to enforce these changes in Canada. So I mean, Canada is a sovereign country. We should not depend on the laws created in other countries to de facto apply to us. We should be developing our own. Right. Is there a policy agenda in the works for something like this in Canada? I mean, there is broadly. For the past couple of years, the federal government has been developing two big policy agendas in this space. Some rules around online harms, about what can and can't be said and done on platforms in Canada, and updating our Privacy Act, right? Which, as we've talked about, is a real cornerstone here, is the way in which our data is collected. And both of these could have specific elements that address kids, but at the moment, they don't. And so that's where the policy focus, I believe, needs to be. How do we both make sure that these bills are crafted appropriately and also make sure that they include specific provisions for protecting kids. Right. And there's been lots of media around how much of an appetite there is for stuff like that in the United States. Is it something that Canadians seem to want? Yet way more so than our public debate seems to reflect. Hmm. There's a lot of debate about both of those bills, the Privacy Act and the Online Harms Bill that the government has been developing that I, th I think gives the impression that there is real divide amongst the population about whether they even want governments to do something. And that's just not what we see. There's overwhelming support in the broad population for much stricter regulations than the government's even considering. And on kids in particular, those numbers go up even higher if you ask Canadians, do you want the government to help you protect your kids online? The numbers are through the roof. Right. And our conversations with parents in this series definitely reflects the same. Absolutely. Okay, let's get back to the interview. The next thing Bieben touched on was that this legislation is just the beginning. She compared it to the Industrial Revolution when there wasn't one law that created modern standards around labor, but rather a series of laws over time regulating factory work. There was also the invention of the sewers and street lighting and the weekend was invented and all of those things were regulated as a result. Thank you for that, of... by the way. <laughs> Much appreciated. Yes. Yeah. My, great, my great pleasure. I take full responsibility. All of these things and dozens, dozens more were brought in as a result of industrialization. So, you know, what I'm trying to say is, look, we've seen it before 150 years ago. We see it this tiny little green shoot of the age appropriate design code, and we know it works. Now let's get on it, guys. So right now in North America, to access a lot of the platforms that we talk about in this series, like Instagram and, and YouTube, users have to be 13. You've talked about moving that age to, to 18 years old. And that sort of takes us into the territory of age verification online, where here in North America as well, if a child goes to a particular website, it will ask them to input their age. And the clear flaw there is that they can put whatever they'd like. <laughs> How do we get around that problem? First of all, I would like to just point out that it is really curious to me, you know, that, uh, and in fact, this, these are the words of a 12 year old boy, so let me give credit where it is due. Nice. He goes, Always. Miss, <laughs> how come they know I like red Nikes, but they don't know I'm 12, right? Hmm. The answer is that it's in their commercial interest to know you like red Nikes, and it's in their commercial interest to avoid knowing that you're 12. So the idea that age verification in and of itself is going to create more surveillance is actually a false idea because the more surveillance is happening, it's just that, that it's not happening for that reason. Now, I am a big advocate of privacy preserving age assurance and actually there's a lot of approaches and some of them are sort of, you know, like a digital coin that you get a verification and you use your token around the internet saying, oh, I'm 12, you don't need to know anything else about me, but that I'm 12, but that I'm 14 and so on. Secondarily, that where you as a company are actually straying into areas which are age inappropriate, that you do more work of establishing who you're dealing with and saying, no, 
you can do this, but you can't do that. And that actually, you know, one of my big beefs at the moment, and I'm doing a piece of research about it, is, is around the login. Because actually, if you're logging in through Facebook, through TikTok, through Google, you tell me, what are we sharing? What information? What's coming back? What's the deal? between all those companies. Well, here's the interesting thing. If you're logged in in one of those places with your age verified, what's happening to you in the supply chain? So my point is, and I do hope that we're going to bring in a age assurance minimum standards code here in the UK in the next 18 months. I have a private member's bill, which the government is resisting, but I believe it will eventually, you know, re-emerge in the online safety bill. And that's what we need. People are right not to trust age verification because there's no rules of the road. It feels like a lot of what you've introduced and the way you talk about this is about shifting some of the responsibility away from individuals and on to the companies that ultimately are determining how we engage online and making money off that, obviously. In the U.S., a lot of that, and in, in most countries, a lot of that onus is on people and uploaders of content. So if I'm uploading a piece of content on YouTube in the U.S., I can say it's going to likely to be directed at a kid, and then YouTube has to treat it a certain way, right? Like put it in YouTube Kids or whatever. But you're shifting it to something you call likely to access, and the platform has to actually make a determination themselves and has the duty, to use the language of the online safety bill, like they have the duty to determine themselves whether a kid is likely to see this thing. Yeah. How can platforms determine what is more likely to be seen by kids and what isn't? So the way we've described it in regulation here is that it's more probable than not. And how you come to more probable than not is by your own research of your user base, if you are similar to other services that have lots of kids, if you have things that kids are known to like, like cartoons and, you know, the format and so on, and if external research says that either a large number or a large proportion of kids are on your site. Now, at a certain point, Somebody probably can and will go to court to say we are not likely to be accessed. But at a certain point, there's a reasonableness thing, which is with all of those things, if you have 20 million kids on your site, then that's blown out of the water. Right. I think that what the tech sector is really good at, and I must say some of our academics around the world are also very good at, is sort of kind of getting lost in the edge case. And... I will say this as someone who absolutely believes in regulation as the route forward, is regulation's not here to get the big fines. That's irrelevant. Regulation's here to get compliance. So, you know, yes, we're going to push some of the things, but I am less interested in the three kids who lied about their age and were on a platform that no one could have foreseen that they might be on than I am about the tens of millions of kids who are having a bad time right now. And I sort of really, you know, want to underline this point, which is kids do lie about their age, but hundreds of millions, there's a nearly a billion kids online, hundreds of millions tell the truth. And you know which hundreds of millions tell the truth? The ones who are over 13. They're kids and they're being treated like adults. <laughs> but right now we have a situation where we literally put extreme, hardcore, misogynist porn into the hands of eight-year-olds without a thought. The scale of misdeed is so great that I am actually not prepared to deal with the edge case until we see a sea change. We've been speaking to lots of kids and, and parents and researchers, and what's become very clear is how savvy kids are in these spaces, sometimes more savvy than the adults in the room when it comes to how to make these spaces work for them. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on what would happen if we just kind of left things as is and let the kids navigate these spaces in ways that make sense to them, 
create the defenses that come up naturally as they do that and not push for policy change. How do you see that scenario playing out? I actually see that very poor. And I think the, the reason that I say it's very poor is not that kids aren't creative and I would make a very strong case. And, and I think you guys know that we at Five Rights, we work with children. You know, a lot of their voice comes through our work and a lot of the ideas that I originally put into the code came from young people who I have spoken to. So do they, should they, must they have agency in the solution to this? Yes, absolutely. But leave it alone. No, there's two or three things you can say. One is that the beast is getting hungrier every minute and more intrusive. And, you know, what are we going to do? The young people who I speak to, and I really do speak to them on, you know, weekly basis, different groups, they say, we can't put it down. It's tugging at our thing. We don't know how to read anymore. We don't know how to talk or look each other in the eye. You know, that actually I feel that unless I look like this, I'm never going to be happy. And again, and I point you and your listeners to the Pathways Project, because actually we go through the engineers who are building these things, and each one of them said, you know, please, please get our bosses to tell us not to design to addict. That's what we do. We design to addict. We design to tug. We design to survey. We design in ways that are absolutely harmful to kids. I mean, they all spoke on, you know, anonymously because they'd lose their job. But actually, if you go to the great universities and say to the computer scientists, what are you being taught to do? They're being taught to monetize data, uh, extend use, spread information and build value. They are not being told the impact of those things on young people. Stepping back a bit to this broader policy conversation, I mean, a lot of our this whole conversation we're having right now and why we're having to have this and a lot of the reason we're having to do this show is because of this single court ruling in California that made a kid 13 and platforms then adopted that and those platforms are used by people around the world. So this, this single act of governance at a fairly local level determined the online lives of billions of people around the world. And inversely or similarly, your age appropriate design code was implemented in a country and is now changing the behavior of those companies in ways that are benefiting users around the world, right? So what does that tell us about how we govern the internet generally? It's something I think about an awful lot, and I, I have sort of two answers to it. The one is that we should have, you know, sort of minimum global standards, and it should be roughly in the same direction and you know if they were going to play ball instead of push back you know that's what you would want but you know what this is guerrilla warfare there's no officer class in this you know there's no negotiation in no man's land I think that if you think about it I would advise every jurisdiction to copy the best that there is instead of making their own and if they can uplift it a bit, great, moving forward. But actually, because what you've said is true, you know, we got to take what Australia did around press and see how we can take that and build what we did about the age appropriate design code and bring it in in Canada, bring it in in America, bring it in in Europe. You know, it becomes the new norm. And then the next bit will be the online harms bill. Maybe it'll be DSA, maybe it'll be Irish, maybe it'll be the one we're working on. But they are all phenomenally similar. And the highest bar we get will be the lowest bar of the companies because in the end, they pile them high, sell them cheap. It is not worth their while having different things all over the place. And I just think the more we get around the world and the more it is based on safety by design and design principles and human rights principles and children's rights principles, the better place we all go. The one thing that consistently strikes me in hearing you speak and with the work you've done is that all of the things you're fighting for are things that I would like on my internet too, or a lot of them, not just for my eight-year-old, but for me. And I'm wondering if what you're really doing here is having a conversation about the internet we all want, not just for kids, but for everyone. 
I have your eight-year-old, not you, in my sights. I am in a particular part of my life and I would like to see this happen at global scale for kids. I do think as a citizen, as an adult, there are things that I would like that I'm fighting for for kids. But I think once we see the impact of what we can do for kids, then two things happen. One is those kids grow up having agency in the digital world and they will not accept what we have accepted. And the second thing is, yeah, maybe someone else who's not me will fight some of these fights for the adults. And I say that and I don't, you know, I don't mean to be dismissive in any way, but I think, you know, first comes first. I think that kids do not have, you know, electoral capital. They do not have some of the agency and platforms that are afforded to adults. They cannot write comment pieces in our press, you know, so they do need representation. They don't know yet what they can demand. And so we have to do this bit for them and we have to get it over the line and we must not be distracted by our own need. What we have to do is get it right for the kids. Bebe and Kendrin, thank you very much. Thank you so much. So as you could probably tell, I'm a pretty big fan of Baroness Beban Kidron. <laughs> I can absolutely see why. She's a very impressive person. Yeah, and I, th- I think a really good way to close our season. I know I've learned a ton from this show, both from the kids and parents that we've gotten to speak to, and, and from all the experts around the world who we've got to talk through some of these issues with. Ultimately, a lot of what we've heard has been about individual behavior and how kids are adapting and being really creative in how they deal with some of these problems they find online, and about how parents can provide oversight and speak more openly to their kids about these same issues. And I think all of that is undoubtedly true. But what Bieben brings home for me is that these are also collective issues. These are about how our society functions in these digital spaces, and how about the design and incentive of these technologies affects all of us. And sometimes for those things, I think we need collective responses. And that necessarily ends up in a conversation about government, which is where we've ended up today. Yeah. And like you said, this is the last episode of our season. So let's talk about some of the big things we've learned throughout this project. I'll start. One of the things that struck me is just how essential young people are in this conversation. We made a really meaningful effort to involve them in each of our episodes. And there's a common phrase that you hear when covering vulnerable communities, either through journalism or through research, which is not about us without us, meaning that meaningful involvement of the vulnerable community that you're discussing always ends in a better result. And so they should always be included. And that totally rings true here. And I think, you know, I'm from a generation where a lot of the instruction in the family around setting rules when it came to the use of media came from the top down. But that's because my parents grew up with the same type of media that I was consuming, like TV, for example. And that's definitely where a lot of the anxiety that we heard from parents came from is the change in that where parents aren't sure what their kids are doing when they're using their devices or playing on their phones and meeting kids in games. And so an important part of setting norms around this stuff is exploring it with kids and talking to them about it. Absolutely, and this show and and what we've learned has really changed how I've certainly talked about these issues with my son and how we talk about all of the good and bad aspects of the tools he uses and to encourage him to kind of communicate those feelings both ways, both the things he likes about them, but the things he also finds more worrying, because kids do have worries here. The other thing that's become really clear to me is that kids are growing up with a set of technologies that are just fundamentally different than what we had, and their relationship to them and their expectations of them are just different. They see these technologies as places not where they consume information or even play a game, but where they socialize, where there's meaningful social interaction and they're places that they actively participate in building. They're not just consuming 
a thing that was built for them. When they speak on social media, when they build something in Minecraft, they are actively creating this world and playing a role in it. And the way in which these tools are ultimately designed does play a real role in what they are allowed to build, what those social interactions look like. And so I, I really think this takes us again to this question of policy of like, how do we make sure that the incentives and the design of these systems are creating the right environment for our kids? Yeah, and we heard from researchers like Candace Augers about how design on the platform side makes it difficult to research kids as they get older and touching on the point you just made about agency, kids are really using these platforms, especially teenagers in unique ways that make them hard to study, right? And this is a challenge that you know all too well, right, Taylor, which is that studying these things from the outside without the data that the platform has on users to help the research along can be a huge challenge. Yeah, and the, and the first thing any researcher or academic always says is we need more research, right? So you'd expect <laughs> me to say that. But I have to say that I was hoping we'd get more clarity from the researchers we spoke to around the world. I mean, we had access to some amazing people who were at the forefront of studying this stuff. And I'm still left with tons of ambiguity about the nature of these harms and how these technologies are shaping the lives of our kids. And that signals to me that we need far better data. And that's something we heard from almost everybody we spoke to. Absolutely. I guess the final thing that really hit home for me as a parent is just the degree to which kids are modeling their behavior after us. I mean, we heard from a number of people calling out parents for being hypocrites here. <laughs> and I think everyone who has been called out by their kid for like staring at their iPhone as opposed to playing with them or engaging with them feels this like deep guilt about that. And so I, I think there is an element here of us modeling a different kind of behavior and a different kind of value even to our kids. But, and the final thing I'll say, is that there are limits to individual behavior. These are large-scale structural systems that are embedded in all aspects of our society, our economy, our lives. And when that's the case, you do need bigger structural solutions. Mm -hmm. Despite all that, one of the things that sticks with me from all the conversations that I've had with kids is the joy they experience online. The digital world is a very real part of our lives now, and it has the potential to be really positive. As we're talking about all the systemic problems and about fixing things, I think it's important that we don't lose sight of what we're fighting for. So to end, I'll hand things back to the kids. Sometimes when I'm sad, I just want to watch a funny video or like listen to music or watch TikToks. And you know, social media can be fun too. Like I can get inspiration. My style is basically based off of social media. My, the way I do my hair, the way I do my makeup, it's all pretty much based off of social media and the inspiration that I see from there. There's another really famous YouTube channel called The Odd Ones Out. That's not the one, but it's, it's similar. It's like animations, but not like anime, not like any kind of complicated animations. Kind of just a bunch of like, they're all five minute stories about like his childhood and different things that happened in his life, but he explains them in a pretty, like, fun, funny way. We make the cookies with frosting with Elmo and the chocolate chip cookies with Cookie Monster. When you make it with Cookie Monster, there's only Cookie Monster, and you never know what happens when you give it to Elmo. Yeah, we FaceTime every weekend. We'll have, like, dance parties or or we will pick each other's outfits, or we'll do a photo shoot. Go, go, okay, go, okay. go, go, hey, go. Hey, I did it. <sighs> now you turn the screen so you're facing towards the side of the beam. Oh, smart. And you go forward. What do you like about watching other people play games? I sometimes get inspired, plus they're super more entertaining than I am. <laughs> I try to be entertaining, but I fail miserably, and that's the first step of being entertaining, failing miserably. <laughs> Thanks for listening to season one of Screen Time from TVO, Antica Productions, and the Center for Media, Technology, and Democracy at McGill University. If you haven't heard the rest of the season, go back and listen now. I 
produce the show along with our senior producer, Kevin Sexton. Mixing and sound design by Phil Wilson and Mitchell Stewart. Production assistance by Emily Morantz. Research assistance by Sonia Solomon, Cody Hauka, and Helen Hayes. Our executive producer is Laura Regeer. Stuart Cox is the president of Antica. Katie O'Connor is the senior producer of podcasts at TVO. Lori Few is the executive producer for digital at TVO. If you like this show, tell a friend. Okay, bye. <laughs> okay, bye. 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 <laughs> bye. bye. <laughs> Thank mm-hmm. you.